Hey everyone, this is Robert King to goldsilverpros.com. It is Wednesday, May 19th, 2021, and we have something very special for you today. I hinted at this on Twitter last week, and we're going to throw some bombshells at the gold and silver market today. Those of you who are subscribers to my newsletter website know that in the last film quarterly I put out about a month ago, I talked about some of the issues that people are having with these pooled and unallocated metal storage companies. And part of what has been reported over the last couple of months by John Adams, among others, were anecdotal evidence that the Perkment was experiencing some problems with delivering metal. Uh, while those are very important reports, uh, they were anecdotal. There were a few customers here and there. And so we were basically setting out to try to figure out, did the Perkman actually have the metal they said they had? I was contacted recently by a chartered financial accountant. I'll show you who he is in a minute who uh, looked at the audited financial statements available on the Perkman's website. We'll show you those in a minute as well and looked through them and figured out that he thought that the Perkman was running a fractional reserve metal system. And what we've done is take a look at the financial statements. He rebuilt a trial balance for us and I went and audited his trial balance and the financial statements. And I think I happen to agree with his analysis. So we're gonna get into that and we're gonna show you how Perkman is running a fractional reserve uh, metal system. And if you're a customer, you probably wanna get your metal and or your cash out of that system immediately. I'm not gonna waste a lot of time mincing words. We're gonna get into the data and we're gonna show via the audited financial statements available on Perk's own website that they're running a fractional reserve system and that they're highly illiquid right now and they're on verge of eventually becoming insolvent. So let's jump right into it. Uh, I know we're using some so we're making some big statements here, but we're going to use data to show why it is the case that we think Perkmint is eventually going to be in trouble. They're very close to being in trouble. Uh, one, Daniel Vigario contacted me uh, about this issue. He's a chartered uh, accountant, as you can see. He currently lives in London, England, but he's chartered in South um, Africa. And I'm going to show that he is lists on his LinkedIn account, chartered accountant. Whether credential ID 0817-1321, issued May 2008. And you can see here that he's uh, Chief Financial Officer of Livemore, also has worked in various other roles in finance. Seems legitimate. We went to verify on the South African um, Institute of Chartered Financial Accountants, his ID and name. We did, we entered his ID and name here. And you can see right here, he has been a charter, chartered financial accountant since 2008 and he is in the UK. So it seems legitimate that he has the skills in order to do what he has done. We've just validated that. Of course, you guys know that I have an auditing background. So put his two together and you have a charge accountant and an auditor that have looked at these financial statements and agree on the conclusions of those financial statements. At the very, very end, I'm gonna show you the concerns that we have on a one page Word document, of what we saw in those reports, okay? We're going to outline it for you, but I'm, I'm actually going to dive into the data. We're going to get real uh, data crazy here and, and, um, and basically pr or prove essentially with the financial data what we think is going on at the first minute. So we're moving beyond a couple of anecdotal reports and some, some probably well-founded fears about the first minute actually showing via their own financial statements that they're in serious trouble. All right. Now. Where do we get the, the annual reports? It's right here at perthmint.com, about us, and then annual reports. You can see you get there by going to home, about, reports and policies, and then annual reports. And we're looking at this report right here, the 2019 to 20 annual report. And if I click on that link, it loads a document that looks like this. And you're gonna see that here in a minute. That is the Gold Corporation annual report, which is the Perth Mint. And, uh, Here's the acknowledgments and the statement of uh, contents, including all of their financial statements, which start on page 63, and uh, the statement of compliance uh, about how they're complying with the uh, Section 63, the Financial Management Act 2006, there in Australia. And uh, this is the annual report of Gold Corporation ended 30th of June 2020. So we're going to get into this and show you what is going on there. Uh, I will, we will put all the links to everything that we're going to be looking at here uh, in the description of this video. So you guys can go look at this yourself. If you're an auditor or an accountant, or you just have read a lot of financial statements and you want to go back and validate our work, we will include all of this for you. So you can do this yourself. We're not making this up. 
This is not fear mongering. This is not based upon our supposition. This is based upon the published financial statements available on the PurseMints website, which I just showed you. Now I want to share a different screen where we're actually going to go and look at the trial balance that Daniel had put together for us. Let's get right into that. So again, this is from the annual report, as you can see here, same PDF document uh, that was available on their website. And I'll be probably referring to that a couple of times in the presentation. I just want to run down to the financial section to let you know what is here. It starts on page 63. We'll just fast forward to that page real quick. Financial report through the 30th of June, 2020. That is about a year ago, give or take, about a month short. And here are all their financial statements and they have notes. So what um, Daniel has done, he, the, he did not have the balance sheet for the Perth Mint, but what you can do is you can build a trial balance if you look through the financial statements. And all a trial balance is, and why accountants use a trial balance is they match debits and credits in double entry accounting. If the debits and credits match on either side, then they know that at least they don't have any egregious data errors on one side of the other ledger. Now, it doesn't prove that each one of those ledger entries is in itself valid or mathematically correct. It just shows that the two sides balance. So that's one of the checks that they use. But in terms of each individual entry, an auditor or an accountant would have to go through each one of those to, to have an opinion on that. But the trial balance, what it does is it shows you the, the financial standing of a company, a corporation, or an entity. And one of the things that, that Daniel told me on the phone when we talked was, Hey, Rob, you know, there are anecdotal evidence of the Perth Mint having problems delivering metal. When you see something like that as a chartered financial accountant, like he was, he said, the first thing you do is go and look at the financials and figure out what's going on. So here are the financials over many, many pages in this PDF, and they have individual notes. So you can look at the individual notes. And what the notes do is they define each individual item. So right here, revenue from contracts and customers is defined in note four, for example. I'm not calling this out specifically. I'm just saying, if you wanted to go to note four, you would scroll down here into the notes section. Uh, note two is actually very, very long. So it's gonna take us a while, but we're gonna get to note four and I'm gonna show you the notes where you can pull out additional information. So here's the note on four and this is revenue contracts from customers. So that's how you do it. You go look at the top of their actual financial statement and then you go through the notes and it, and it defines terms and it gives you amounts and tells you details about that, like how they classify cash and cash equivalents. Now. One of the things that Daniel pointed out was he doesn't believe these financial statements are following IFRS, which is international, um, basically financial regulation scheme, and is sort of kind of like generally accepted accounting principles in the U.S., although not exactly the same. They don't match up one for one. But IFRS is a way to compare, say, financial statements across different um, accounting regimes in the world against each other and have some idea that they're, they're using the same methodology, if you will. So it's, a, it's just an international uh, accounting statement standard, if you will. He doesn't believe this report meets those standards. So we're not going to be able to call out some of the specific metal allocations like between gold and silver because they don't have to disclose it because he doesn't believe they're following IFRS regulations. If you want to know more about IFRS, just look it up online. I guarantee you, you will find a ton of documentation. So we're going to move to his trial balance. So uh, he put the link to this PDF right here. Um, and it does link to that site. And he basically rebuilt the trial balance over several years. He went all the way back to 13 to year to date 20. So this is year 20, uh, year 19, year 18, so on and so forth. And what he did was he rebuilt a balance sheet from those financial statements. He, looked, he went through that PDF and started pulling out all of the assets and liabilities and, and statements of equity and rebuilt it. And he's got some interesting findings for us. Now, I will let you know that in this column, column F, for the year to date 20, which matches this document, this PDF off the website, I tracked every single number he has here to this document. So I can confirm that every number he has here is true and accurate as of this document. Um, so I believe he has correctly built the trial balance, but if you guys you know, are an accountant and you wanna look at it yourself, we would love to hear your opinion. Now. Some of the things that stand out, and I'm gonna do my best to narrate through this. This is a lot of numbers, and for people who aren't accountants or auditors and haven't seen this kind of stuff before, your eyes may cross as you look at the screen. I don't want you to worry too much about that. I'm just gonna pull certain things out and talk about certain things. And I'm gonna make this super simple. I'm not gonna go through every line. I'm not gonna walk through the exercise of auditing a balance sheet and to the notes and flip back and forth between these two, because I think everybody, everybody would be bored to death at the end. 
I'm just going to include the files and let you guys do it yourself. I'm going to let the public validate what Daniel has done and what I've validated here is actually true and correct. Okay. We're going to let you guys decide. So potentially millions of people can put their eyeballs on this and check and see if we're correct. So we're not, again, we're not making a supposition and backing it up with, with anecdotal evidence or making an accusation with no evidence or, or, or anything like that. I want to make it clear. We have rebuilt the trial balance from the published documents that the Perth Mint has put out on their website. And I'm going to stick those on the internet so you can validate if, if any of our numbers are incorrect. And, and specifically, I validated column F. I didn't go through the other years because what you'll see and what we're talking about is an aggregation anyway. So I only have to look at the last year because some of the deficits in the metals, uh, you only have to validate you know, the end year to know if it's correct uh, because the numbers add up uh, as you go right to left on this chart to this final number. That's why I spent time doing column F, but I believe Daniel has done all of the work here. And again, he's a chartered financial accountant. I showed you his, his licensure and his credentials and his work history available on LinkedIn. He on LinkedIn has, has said, feel free. These are just public financial statements. I don't mind if you mention my name. So he's okay with this. And so anyway, we're going to get into this. So he's highlighted several things here. And I, I wanted to point out, if you look on page 66, note 10, I will go to page 66, note 10, just to show you it exists, but I'm not going to do this on every one. Note 10 right here is trades and other receivables. Okay. That's note 10. That's what he's talking about. Uh, there is a number here. Uh, of 842,919. Now this is in thousands. So every number here, you add a comma three zero. So this is 842,919,000 is receivables and advances to customers. Receivables and advances to customers. Let's go to note 10 and we'll just read from note 10. What the heck is a receivable and advance to a customer? All right, trade assets and receivables. Um, Trade receivables and contract assets are written off when there is no reasonable expectation of recovery. Now, I'm not saying they've written it off yet, but that's interesting that they use that language on note 10, that there's a possibility that this receivable could be written off. Indicators that there is no reasonable expectation of recovery include amongst others, the failure of a debtor to engage in payment plan, so on and so forth. So in other words, this receivables is something that's been lent out, but it has not been paid for, has not been paid for. Uh, that's, that's the big note here. Um, past due, but not impaired. So they're talking about that. But anyway, it's a receivable, something you expect to be paid for in the future. It's kind of like you ship a product to a customer and you don't get paid yet. That's kind of essentially what this is. And that's $842 million for year to date 20 as of June 30th, 2020, per the Perth Mint. We're going to go back up here. Remember, this is as of June 30th of 2020, according to their own document. And it was reported on September 11th, 2020. Okay, so that's straight from the Perth Mint. Now we go down here to precious metal inventory. They have $5.4 billion of inventory, uh, 514 million of that sitting in the ETF. Now, the, here's the, the thing to remember as we go through this. The ETF was only started recently. I believe it started in 2019, if I'm correct, or maybe late 2018. Uh, no, it started in 2019. So you can see in this column, there was a zero in the ETF and year to date 18. And then in year to date 19, they had an entry. And you can see the buildup of the ETF. So people were investing in the Perth ETF the last few years. And we believe based upon the numbers that it's quite possible that they were using that investment to take care of their other metal accounts. So you can see the Perth Mint building up year to date 19, it was 190 million. And then it made an astounding jump year to date 20 over that year of 514 million. Here are the two keys that we want to show you. There are two types of borrowings. There's an interest bearing borrowing and there is a non-interest bearing borrowing. If you add these two numbers up, you come up with a really big amount. It's six point something billion dollars. That's the real number to pay attention to. So some of it's interest bearing, meaning they're gonna get something paid back with interest and some of it's non-interest bearing, meaning they're not gonna get it paid back with interest. So as we scroll down here, there are also some non-controlling interest in the ETF. That means people that don't actually own the Perth Mint have a certain amount of controlling interest in the metal. And that's another thing to pay attention to as well. Here is the fair adjusted value of the Perth Mint physical gold, negative uh, 36 million and uh, allocated to NCI, which is um, the, the non-controlling entities or non-controlling interest I showed you was the majority of that 26 million. Anyway, just some details on the trial balance. We haven't gotten to the fireworks yet but I wanted to show you some of those things and let you know that I did audit this column and his numbers back to this published, 
public document on the Birth Smith website and it all added up. And I just called out some of the ones that we're gonna be using in our calculations here. So first thing to note in 19 and 20, they have a net short. Actually in 18, they started going net short. What this net short is all of their allocated metal. This is what they actually physically have minus what they have loaned out in terms of interest bearing and non-interest bearing. So remember these two numbers were up here in the balance sheet, uh, these numbers right here, borrowings interest bearing and borrowings non-interest bearing. I believe that's on page 66. So if you wanna go look at the report, we'll go back to 66. And there'll be some notes on that as well, but that it matches the numbers that you have here uh, in terms of interest bearing and non-interest bearing assets. So you can look at page 66 if you want and find all of that information. I'm not gonna go back and retrace it here. But in other words, they have loaned out more metal to the tune of 6.3 billion than they actually have contained. Okay, I wanna say that again. This is the, 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 the probably the biggest thing to pay attention to. They have loaned out more metal since 18 in the last you know 18 to 20, because this is June 30, 2020, it's actually almost a year old. In about two, two and a half years, they've loaned out more metal that they have not been paid for, and I'll show you that in a minute, than they actually have in the, the sum of all of their allocated, unallocated, and pooled precious metal stock. What they have in their allocated, unallocated, and pooled precious metal stock is $5.4 billion worth of gold and silver. Now, they don't break out gold and silver in this report. So we're combining gold and silver together. We don't know how much of this is gold, how much of the silver, because it's not falling IFRS regulations to break out the inventory numbers. Okay, just wanted to point that out. But we know it's a combination of gold and silver. It's a combination of those metals. They have 5.4 billion. They've loaned out 6.398 billion. This number is the sum of these two numbers, F99 and F100. You can see here. So this is F99 and F100. So that leads to 6.3 billion. So they have a, a leverage multiple of 1.17, meaning their net long and short of $929 million. Net short, $929 million worth of metal. So then the next thing that Daniel did was, well, what do they have in terms of short-term assets? Because we know that they're short metal. So what that means, let's just stop here. This section right here means if you went to go get all of your metal right now, if everybody stampeded to Perth Mint and got their metal, they would be short by almost a billion dollars worth of gold and silver combined. They would be short by almost a billion dollars of gold and silver combined. Now, next section, Daniel said, well, what about liquid assets that they could use to cover? Maybe they settle in cash, right? On the COMEX, we talk about selling cash all the time. Maybe they don't have the metal to settle a delivery contract, so they settle in cash. Okay. Can they settle in cash? They're short almost a billion dollars in metal as of June 30th, 2020. Can they settle in cash? Well, if you look at their available liquid assets and liabilities, uh, not exactly. Their net, uh, net negative cash coverage of 146 million bucks. So their net negative cash of 146 million bucks and their net positive ETF holdings only of 169 million. So their ETF holdings would only cover for a very short period of time. I want to say that again. The ETF holdings would only cover for a very short period of time, okay? What is happening here is that they have lent out at fair value, they have lent out at fair value these more metal than they actually have in stock and that their customers are entitled to and they didn't get immediately compensated because they're valued at fair value. And what Daniel explained to me and what I understand is to be correct, when you value something at fair value, that means you didn't get paid for it. It's a receivable and it's something that can fluctuate in value. So you're going to do a fair value calculation every year and say, what's it actually worth? Because that fair value calculation will go into the statement of the balance sheet and what is the worth of the company in the financial statements. So they haven't gotten paid for that metal. Now on the interest bearing, I'm sure they're getting some payments. We think they're getting payments. We could go in and look and see if they're, you know, if there is bad interest debt in there. But at the end of the day, most of it's not interest bearing. The vast majority of it is not interest bearing. So again, they're running essentially a fractional reserve metal system at the Perth Mint according to their own financial statements put together by a chartered financial accountant and looked at by me, a former auditor who's done this sort of thing before. So there you go. They do not have a combination of metal to cover what's owed to their customers and short-term cash. And it appears as though, if you look at the, the ETF uh, amounts, that they're using the ETF, the investment ETF to cover some of those precious metal borrowings. 
And so that ETF, the, the, if we go to uh, the goal that they're getting into the ETF, the fair adjusted value, it's, it's net negative. And it, you know, they started this ETF uh, year to date, uh, 19, I believe. And that those ETF funds apparently have been helping them to cover for all this metal that they're lending out. Now, what the heck are they lending all this metal out for? Uh, we'll get to that here in a moment. But I wanted to summarize the issues that we see with the Perth Mint based upon these financial statements. And again, I'm, we're going to post the files so that you can see them. One, the Perth Mint has lent out a lot of precious metal since 2018 and has not been paid for all of it. Only some of it's even interest bearing, but we're not talking about the original principal or the metal itself. Their financials show a deficit of allocated pooled and unallocated metals against this lending. If there is a run on the mint, the company cannot meet redemptions with enough metal using metal and or cash. They, they flat out can't. So that means that they're illiquid. They're not completely insolvent yet, meaning they, they've gone so far down as to completely going bankrupt, but they're going down that path. The, the, the amounts of net negative are going up. It was net negative, net short, well, they were net long, $49 million year to date, 17. They were net short than over half a billion dollars in 18, then uh, a little bit less in 19. They kind of recovered a little bit. Uh, it went to, no, I'm sorry, it went worse to 672 million. And then now it's almost a billion net net short. So they're a billion net net short. So not insolvent, but they're very liquid. And if there's a run on the Perth Mint, they're in trouble because they can't meet it even with receivables. Uh, the mint is showing a net short of vaulted metal against customer account lendings. The metal is lent at fair value, indicating future settlement date, increasing the risk on the mint in terms of a price and a liquidity basis. So they've got a lot of risk toward ever getting that metal back. The ETF metals might be used to cover delivery obligations, but their financials are not completely clear on the matter. We think the ETF is being used, but because they don't break it down, you know, in specific flows from like account to account because we don't have the actual account level we don't know but we suspect because you can see a buildup in the etf and those metals are more than likely you you see the corresponding buildup in the etf and you see the corresponding buildup in the amount of metals that they're short so let's go down here to this line this line right here the total leverage the total leverage is going up and it seems as though the etf is probably covering for that we really need to get further into their, in, into their unpublished financials to know that and lastly, since the financials do not break out the metals categories, it's likely a combination of both gold and silver in unknown proportions. We do not know. So those are the issues that we have. The question is, how long will it take at this pace for the Perth Mint to go under? Uh, we don't know. But for all of those people that provided anecdotal evidence to John Adams and everybody else about the Perth Mint, and you know, people criticizing John Adams for reporting that. We've just shown, according to their financial statements, they're running a fractional reserve metal system. They're net short almost a billion dollars. They can't cover the, the, with the physical metal and even their current account receivable, their liquid current account receivable, makes them technically, in accounting terms, illiquid, we believe, unless somebody's gonna come bail them out like the government. And essentially, they're on their way to becoming insolvent. So the recommendation there is, if you have metal with a Perth Mint, you either want to get your metal or get the money out. Either way, get it now because if people, when people find this out, it's going to start making the rounds and people are going to start withdrawing. And all it's going to take is a couple of big withdrawals and all of a sudden you're going to have what's equivalent to a bank run because it's like a fractional reserve metal system, much like you have a fractional reserve bank. And think about banks. They take on, they take in so many deposits, they lend more money out in, in a fractional reserve system, they take in deposits. Uh, they use that cash for the purposes for investments, and then they only have a certain amount of cash in their till. So if everybody goes to the bank at once, you know, they can close down. Uh, same thing can happen to Perth Mint because they've lent out so much metal. They don't have it, and they don't have enough cash at this point as of, you know, June 30, 2020. We don't have their current financial statement for 2021, but as of June 30, 2020, they, they can't cover it. They flat out cannot cover it, and it's right there in their financial statement. And there's, I mean, there's, there's no disputing it at this point. And so the question is, the, 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 the question is, where is that metal gone? Who did they lend it to? We're talking about a lot of metal, over $6 billion worth of metal. Who has the capacity to take on $6 billion worth of metal? Is it one of these exchanges, the COMEX, London? Is it a, you know, a, a big bullion bank, uh, some huge gigantic player in the market or a series of huge gigantic players? We don't know, but apparently Perth Mint's been supplying a lot of metal. Is it to industry? Is it to people to use you know, gold for jewelry and silver for all these applications? I mean, it could be. It could be going to producers who are actually using the metal for, for certain purposes. 
but it's in such a big amount, it would have to be really big group of producers. I'm, I'm completely speculating here, but based upon the amounts that I saw in those financial records, I would speculate some of this probably went to the exchanges to bail out uh, the COMEX and the LBMA the last couple of years. And probably some of it went to some wealthy individuals, maybe for certain purposes, and probably some of it went to industrial purposes, whether it be jewelry or in silver solar panels in China or medical implements, or maybe even coining of government coins or bars and around I mean, investment demand, who knows? But it's not sitting at the Perth Mint and they don't have enough cash to cover it if people have a run on the Perth Mint. So again, given the numbers that we have, we believe the Perth Mint is technically illiquid at this time and they're in danger of becoming insolvent if that trend that we've seen 18 to 20, 2020, 2018 to 2020, according to their financials, continues down the same path. Now in about a month or so, a little over a month, we should get the Perth uh, Mint's financials for 2021. And we're gonna see if that trend continues or if somebody's bailing them out or if they're getting the metal back. Maybe, you know, luck of the Irish, you know, in a month and a half from now, we see them getting the, the metal back, but that's not what we saw the trend the last three years. So it appears to me that those anecdotal reports of the Perth Mint being out of metal and having trouble delivering on time, they're not just anecdotal, they're legit. And again, we're using published financial reports, audited financial reports to show this. Uh, the CFA, Daniel put this together and I went back through it and validated all the numbers. Trial balance looks legitimate to me. Okay, so this is something that we want to do for you guys. We want to bring you a lot of financial intelligence. So I'm going to go and advertise something that we're doing on our website. So let me get out of the meeting controls here. We have put together something Gold Silver Pros. We're starting a professional research team. We're calling it the Financial Intelligence Network. And we have a Google Docs form here where if you want to do this kind of research and send it to us, uh, you can fill out this form. Uh, the subscribers to our website, the free subscribers got this form about two weeks ago. We've already had a bunch of signups. I always send things like this to my website subscribers first. So if you wanna get on that list, you simply go to goldsilverpros.com and you click on the newsletter link at the top and you will get these emails as we're doing them. So again, goldsilverpros.com, click on newsletter, simply enter your email, you'll get on our free newsletter list and you will get notified of these kind of cool things ahead of time. If you wanna do some research for us like Daniel did and you wanna submit that data, we will have a member of the team curate that data and we will start reporting on that. Now, we don't have to use your name. I, I intend to make this service completely anonymous, 100% anonymous. So if you wanna research, send research and not tell us who you are, you know, that's fine. Uh, we'd like you to put your name at least so we know who you are, so we have some accountability, but we will not report. If you don't want us to, we won't report who you are. But what we're gonna do is look at the best of the data that we get and we're gonna start reporting it. So you get this real time, really good, uh, high quality sort of financial intelligence on the channel. And that, people that know me know I do a whole bunch of research, but even I can't keep up with all the information that's going on at once. So we're forming this professional research team, the Financial Intelligence Network, so that you guys can contribute and send us your reports. Uh, once we get enough people signed up on this list, we'll close down this form. We will uh, email people and get everybody integrated. We will put out a place for you to deposit your information. Uh, be patient with us. This is going to take a few weeks to get everything put together because it's a big undertaking, the amount of data that we're going to receive and that we have to parse through and getting everybody on the list and all that. But we're going to do this over the next couple of weeks and expect in June me to start uh, announcing uh, the collection of this data and we'll start reporting on some of that data. So I just wanted to advertise that for you guys, okay? Um, this is going to end the program. I'm going to make it as short as possible. I think this is a huge bombshell. I think the repercussions are that we see one of the major mints around the world uh, has lent out a lot of metal and doesn't have it. We have long suspected the central banks have done this as well through leasing and swap. In fact, we know they have because they have data on leases and swaps. So the true question here is, in the bigger picture, it's not just about the Perth Mint and if you're a customer, you want to get your money up. The bigger question to me is, who's taking the metal? What are they using it for? And how much of a fractional reserve system, you know, if we see the Perth Mint having a fractional reserve system, how much of the rest of the world is fractional reserve? How much is on the exchanges? How much is, you know, uh, anybody else that says they're storing their gold for you? You have to be extremely careful. And this is a case which proves that point. I also want to point out, even though I'm not going to show the data on this program, that Daniel also, I asked him also to go to the U.S. and Canada and look at their uh, mints. He did not see the same issue. He saw better reporting there and he saw the metal you know, as it was, uh, uh, the customer metal was there. So the U.S. and Canadian mints, according to him, don't have the same issue. That's what he says. I haven't audited those uh, financial statements of those two mints. But Daniel said, it seems to be between the three mints, 
It's the PERT mint that having the issues, not the US and Canadian mint. So anyway, I, I will take his word for it because he's done great work there. Again, audited the financial statements, had a CFA look at it. I went and audited the numbers and made sure he put the numbers in correctly. I agree with him. They're about a billion dollars short at the Perth Mint. They're, we think they're technically a liquid and we think that they're on their way to being insolvent unless they get some sort of government bailout. That is the big bombshell. We showed it with data. Wanted to bring this to you guys. Be careful. If you're storing metal somewhere, be careful. Make sure you know where you're storing it and what is going on. And it's not just good enough to talk to somebody on the phone and get their assurance that your metal is safe. What you want to do is you actually want to look at financial statements. Because again, don't wait for somebody to report that they can't get their metal like they did with Perth Mint. You know, or like some people have said with some of these other places. You, you want to go do your due diligence ahead of time. And I would say if you're going to store a substantial amount of metal, you know, $5,000 or more, I would download the financial statement and take it to an accountant and pay them 250 to 300 bucks to look over it for you and indicate if they see any major issues. If you're storing $5,000 more metal, that 250 to $300 fee is really nothing so that you get the peace of mind that, that you're storing it in a safe place, okay? Wanted to throw that out to there, uh, there to you guys. Thank you so much, Daniel, for providing that financial intelligence. I uh, appreciate that very much. I know that was a lot of work that you put into that. I think you're going to be a hero to a lot of people who have their gold and silver Perth Mint and have some concerns. And it raises bigger questions about gold storage around the world. And again, remember to sign up on the Financial Intelligence Network link that we're going to put out on this video. It's a Google Doc. Put in your information. We'll email you at the beginning of June. We'll get all of this started. And we're going to start publishing more of this data as we go on because the tagline for goldsilverpost.com is we do the research so that you don't have to, but if you want to submit some research for the greater good, we'll take that too, and we'll stick it on the program. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate everything. Appreciate your viewership of the channel, and appreciate those guys like Daniel and many others that have submitted so much intelligence over time. We really can use it, and we will get it out to the public to help the good peoples of the world, the we the people who want nothing other than to have safety in their assets and honest money. Until next time, this is Rob Keens at goldsilverpros.com.